In 1985, Nintendo launched the Nintendo Entertainment System in New York and New Jersey to moderate success. Within a year, it was shipped nationwide. But as the North American test launch date drew near, Nintendo released a game for the Famicom in Japan that took the video game industry by storm. That game was Super Mario Bros., a game that revolutionized platforming and fully established the Italian plumber as Nintendo's mascot. It soon spawned a wide variety of sequels and spin-offs with Super Mario Bros. Wonder and a remake of Super Mario RPG coming out this fall. Merchandise also followed, as well as anime projects, three American cartoon series, an unsuccessful live-action film, and a widely successful animated film. Throughout this video, I'll be looking at games in the Super Mario franchise released in the 1980s, the original three games for the NES and Famicom, the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 for the Famicom Disk System, and Super Mario Land for the Game Boy. Gaming Delight presents its retrospective of the Super Mario Bros. games of the 1980s in Episode 3 of The Chronicles of Mario. Before we get to the development of Super Mario Bros., let's look back on the arcade games that preceded it. In 1981, Nintendo released Donkey Kong to arcades worldwide. The game became a household name, and the first worldwide hit for game designer Shigeru Miyamoto. But just before release, Mario was known as Jumpman. But one day, Nintendo of America renamed him Mario, after Mario Sagale the owner and landlord of Nintendo of America's Seattle headquarters. However, some cabinets still use the name Jumpman. In 1982, Nintendo followed up Donkey Kong with Donkey Kong Jr. with Mario as the antagonist. It wasn't as successful as the first game, but it was good enough for Nintendo. In 1983, Nintendo released Mario Brothers to arcades. It too was a big hit. It also marked the debut of Mario's brother Luigi. That is, unless you count the Game & Watch version. Don't be fooled by the second Mario in Donkey Kong Jr. That's not Luigi. In fact, I don't know who it is. In Mario Brothers, you could play solo as Mario, or you could try the two-player option and have a friend play with you as Luigi to compete for the high score, or just to help progress from level to level. These arcade hits were later ported to the Family Computer, or Famicom, in order to drive up sales. It worked, but Nintendo still needed a killer app. Takashi Tezuka, who along with Miyamoto had previously worked on Excitebike and Devil World, observed the sales figures of Mario Brothers and how it consistently sold well. According to an Iwata Ask interview, Tezuka recalled, I thought, this Mario is pretty popular. I recall that I mentioned to Miyamoto-san that Mario was selling consistently well, and he said, Mario seems like the way to go. In December of 1984, Miyamoto wrote test specifications to see how it would feel if Mario was jumping around at twice the size he was in Mario Brothers. He asked the folks at Systems Research and Development to make a prototype, but instead of Mario, it was just a mere red square jumping over a black background. Nonetheless, it was good enough for Miyamoto. Concepts for the game included Mario riding a dinosaur, but technical limitations of the Famicom prevented this. Also among them was a shoot 'em up stage where Mario would shoot at enemies from a cloud, but this idea was abandoned in favor of the usual jumping action. After their Square experiment, in February of 1985, under pressure from SRD's president Toshihiko Nakago, Miyamoto started writing specifications for the new Mario game. Miyamoto and Tezuka drew levels on graph paper, which Nakago and his team would program into the game. In designing maps, they made the background blue in some stages, which was uncommon at the time, considering black backgrounds in video games were the norm. Miyamoto's team also implemented the fast-scrolling game engine used in Excitebike into the new Mario game. This allowed Mario to accelerate while walking. 
Miyamoto may have also been inspired by Namco's Pac-Land, a game that pioneered action games with backgrounds scrolling horizontally. Miyamoto wanted to give the player a minute to complete each level. Nakago assumed it would take about 60 screens for a single stage to make this happen. But Miyamoto told him that with blocks, enemies, and other obstacles having a major impact on the player's progress, the SRD only required at least 12 screens per level. The most screens used for a single level in this game was 32, just slightly more than half of what Nakago anticipated. Miyamoto had originally planned for Mario to just be big throughout the game, but the team eventually decided on having not only a large Mario, but the smaller Mario as well, thus creating a new concept. If Mario took a hit while he was large, he'd shrink. If he took a hit while shrunk, you'd lose a life. Then came the idea for the Super Mushroom Power-Up. Said Miyamoto and Eurogamer, We wanted to figure out a way for players to be readily satisfied with the bigger Mario, and so that's actually why we created this small Mario first. Next we started thinking, how do we make him bigger? What is that magical item that we need? And we thought a suspicious mushroom would be globally understood. You try to run away, but by being hit you become bigger, and that makes you feel really happy. Thus, whenever Mario touched a Super Mushroom, he would grow bigger, thereby becoming Super Mario. Hence the name of the new game, Super Mario Brothers. Next came the concept of an antagonist. Shigeru Miyamoto came up with the design of an evil-looking turtle tentatively known as Boss Creeper, named after the Shell Creepers in Mario Brothers. He then considered three other names, Koopa, Hyuke, or Bibimba all of which were derived from the Japanese terms for three Korean dishes, gukbap, soup with rice, yuko, raw meat, and bibimbap, mixed rice. Just talking about all this is making me hungry. But more to the point, kupa was chosen among the three. For kupa's design, Miyamoto took inspiration from Gyu Mao, the ox demon king from the anime film Alakazam the Great. He then combined it with the original boss creeper design and through discussions with Takashi Tezuka, Koopa's final design for the game became more like a turtle. Of course, his earliest known design was already finished in a hurry for the game's box art. The Shell Creepers from Mario Brothers returned as Koopa Troopas, and unlike Mario Brothers, Mario could actually stomp on them, forcing them to hide in their shells and giving Mario the ability to kick them toward other enemies. Smashing two Koopa shells into each other took them both out. Then along came new enemies, Walking Shiitake Mushrooms, known as Karibo, translating to Chestnut Boy, also known as Goombas. Jugem, or Lakitu, a cloud-flying Koopa capable of tossing spike-shelled spinies at Mario. The Buzzy Beetles are hard-shell Koopas with fire-resistant shells. There's also Koopa Paratroopas, Koopa Troopas with wings who bounce or float in mid-air. The Piranha Plants with piranha-like teeth tend to pop out of pipes. The Hammer Brothers are hammer-throwing helmet-clad Koopas. Appearing in underwater stages are squid-like bloopers, later known as bloopers, alongside Cheep Cheep Fish. Underwater, the Cheep Cheeps just swim back and forth, while on land, they jump in and out from the bottom of the screen. Castle stages also feature lava, with potaboos, also known as lava bubbles, popping out occasionally. Finally, there's turtle cannons, now known as Bill Blasters, immobile and indestructible weapons that fire bullet bills, bullet-like projectiles with arms. Composing the music and providing the sound effects was Koji Kondo, who had been with Nintendo since 1983. He'd previously provided the soundtrack for Nintendo's Punch-Out, Arm Wrestling, Devil World, Golf, and Soccer. But compared to his prior works, Super Mario Bros. would prove to be an even greater challenge. Before composing, Kondo was presented with a prototype of the game so he could get a better view of Mario's environment and revolve the background music around it. Using a small piano to write the score, he created fitting melodies. As development of Super Mario Bros. went on, Kondo started to feel that his compositions didn't quite fit the pace, so he made some changes, such as upping the tempos. Some of these compositions were inspired by numerous songs. For example, the Overworld theme sounded similar to Sister Marion by T-Square. The Underworld theme almost sounded like Friendship's Let's Not Talk About It, and the Superstar theme, Summer Breeze by Piper.
Kondo initially intended for the ending theme to be longer, but due to Karcher's limitations, he had to shorten it. Said Kondo, The ending theme for Super Mario Bros. was originally an AABA structure, but we didn't have enough memory, so I had to erase the B part, leaving the A part to repeat over and over. Other compromises had to be made to fit the game's storage of 256 kilobits, such as recoloring some background sprites and recycling sound effects. After the music was implemented, Shigeru Miyamoto found that there were still 20 bytes of storage remaining. To fill the whole cart, Miyamoto added a crown sprite to appear in the player's life counter if they obtained at least 10 lives. Finally, the game was complete, and on Friday, September 13th, 1985, Super Mario Bros. was officially released in Japan. In the game, Princess Toadstool, or Princess Peach, of the Mushroom Kingdom has been kidnapped by the King of All Koopas, later known as Bowser. It's up to Mario and Luigi to save her. Bowser has also kidnapped seven of the princess's mushroom retainers, also known as Toads, and transformed many of the others into numerous items. Princess Peach is the only being capable of reversing the spells, hence why she was kidnapped. To help the Mario Brothers on the way, there are power-ups. As stated earlier, Super Mushrooms make Mario bigger and bash through breakable blocks. This gives him the name Super Mario. Fire Flowers only pop up in lieu of mushrooms if you're Super Mario. These power-ups turn Mario into Fire Mario, with all the same perks as Super Mario, but with an extra feature. Hitting the B button lets Mario shoot fireballs at enemies. However, not all enemies are affected by the fireballs. The Buzzy Beetles are among those immune. Superstars make Mario temporarily invincible, allowing him to plow through enemies without getting hurt. Other items pop up from blocks to help you on your journey. There are coins. Each coin gives you 200 points. Collecting 100 earns you an extra life. Some blocks contain multiple coins depending on how fast you bash it repeatedly. In some blocks, you'll find green 1-up mushrooms. Grabbing one earns you an extra life instantly. As stated earlier, earning 10 or more lives gives you a crown in your life counter. There are also hidden blocks throughout the levels. There are numerous enemies trying to stop you. Goombas, Koopa Troopas, Buzzy Beetles, Piranha Plants, Cheep Cheeps, and Bloopers. Some stages also feature beanstalks, which Mario and Luigi can climb up to reach a secret place called Coin Heaven. There, you can gather as many coins as you can, without any fear of getting touched by enemies. If you want to skip a level, there are warp zones in certain areas. One is located in World 1-2, which has warp pipes leading to World 2, 3, or 4. World 4-2 has two different warp zones. One behind the final pipe leads to World 5, while the other requires finding a secret beanstalk. There you climb all the way up to a warp zone, which has pipes leading to World 6, 7, or 8. In the fourth level of each of the eight worlds, you take on Bowser. Well, at least he looks like Bowser in the first seven worlds. Anyway, to beat him and save a captive mushroom retainer, you toss fireballs at him or just hit the axe behind him to destroy the bridge he's standing on. If you beat the fake Bowser with fireballs, he'll fall into the lava as another enemy depending on the world you clear. In the first five worlds, Bowser spews fire. The last levels of world six and seven, Bowser throws hammers. World eight dash four, the final stage, is where you battle the real Bowser who throws hammers and spews fire. But despite him being more difficult to deal with, once you beat him, Princess Peach is saved, and you've completed the game. After beating the game, you're presented with a new quest. Press B on the title screen, and you can pick a world to take on in hard mode. In this mode, the Goombas are replaced with Buzzy Beetles, elevator-like lifts are shortened, and the fire bars appear in all possible spots. Despite the increased difficulty, it's pretty much the same game. After the game's release, Super Mario Mania swept Japan. 
Retailers had a hard time keeping stock of the game and the Famicom. Mario memorabilia was everywhere. There was even a hit single, Go Go Mario. Within the first month alone, Super Mario Bros. sold 1.2 million copies in Japan. But Nintendo wanted to reach out to the rest of the world. And with the Famicom getting geared up for a test release in the United States as the Nintendo Entertainment System, Super Mario Bros. was necessary to launch with the console. They sent it out to Nintendo of America for review. After the game was sent to the United States for review, Nintendo of America designated it as a launch title for the North American version of the Famicom, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now let's get real here. The exact release date of the original Super Mario Bros. in North America had been debated for years. For a while, the earliest known release date ever archived for Super Mario Bros. in North America was November 17, 1985. But based on this photo of a 1985 launch display with a giant Rob the Robot head, I'm certain that October 18, 1985 was the official launch date of Super Mario Bros. in North America. After successful test launches in major cities, the Nintendo Entertainment System was shipped nationwide along with the new console bundle, the Control Deck. It came with the system, two controllers and the needed hookups, and Super Mario Bros. North American gamers loved it. Sales of the NES rose quickly year after year. Meanwhile, in Japan, Super Mario Bros. was ported as a launch title for the Famicom Disk System, a newly released add-on for the family computer that would play games on proprietary, rewritable floppy disks. The disks held up to 128 kilobytes of data, and the disks were cheaper to make than cartridges at the time. Nintendo also released an arcade port of the game, versus Super Mario Bros. It was pretty much the same, but some levels were modified to amp up the difficulty so as to eat up more quarters. The game was never officially released in Japan, although illegal coin-op versions of the game did hit Japanese arcades. This port of the game eventually led to the development of a sequel to the game. In 1986, R&D 4 began development of Super Mario Bros. 2 for the Famicom Disk System. Nintendo hoped that all their future releases would be exclusive to the add-on, and that a sequel to Super Mario Bros. would help sell hardware. With other projects on his plate, Shigeru Miyamoto took a step back in his role during development. He handed the reins of director over to Takashi Tezuka, but Miyamoto still took part in adjusting levels. The same game engine from the first game was used, and elements from the Versus system port were implemented. Within four months, development of the game was finished. On June 3, 1986, nine months after the release of the first game, Super Mario Bros. 2 was released on the Famicom Disk System. As you can see, the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 is very similar to the first game. Same graphics, same format, and pretty much the same music. This led some gamers to consider this one an expansion pack of the first game, but thanks to the larger capacity of the discs, the ending theme was actually longer as Koji Kondo had originally intended for the first game. And thanks to the extra sound channel in the disc system, the ending theme is greatly improved in many ways. However, there are a few significant changes from the first game. There's no two-player option. Instead, you choose which character to play as, Mario or Luigi. Unlike the first game, where the Mario Brothers, despite having different colored clothing, are exactly the same in every way, the sequel gave Luigi the ability to jump higher. However, he has a tendency to slide on the ground, as if he's on ice. This was the first game in which Nintendo had a chance to distinguish Luigi from his brother. The game itself is also extremely difficult. Some stages require you to find hidden blocks to advance, lest you tumble into an infinite abyss. 
enemies get tougher as you go along. Starting in World 4, there are red piranha plants, which pop out of pipes faster than the green ones, and only stop if you're standing on top of their pipes. Hammer Brothers are also more aggressive. Some stages even feature floating bloopers outside of water stages. As stated earlier, stages were carried over from Versus Super Mario Brothers. There are also poisonous mushrooms that shrink Mario if he's holding a power-up, or kill him if he isn't holding one. You can find one on the first stage of the game. Even a few warp zones can be deceptive. Some send you back to a previous world. The game has unlimited continues after a game over, something the first game didn't have. Instead of starting from scratch, you can start over from the beginning of the world in which you lost your last life. If you finish the level with a multiple of 11, and the last digit of your remaining time matches the digit in your coin total, you'll receive an extra life. Beating the game without warping takes you to World 9. It's almost as if it was designed after the Minus World from the first game. If you beat the game 8 times, and hold down the A button on the title screen, you get to play 4 bonus worlds, A through D. Despite the harsh difficulty in the 9 month gap between the releases of the original game and the sequel, Super Mario Bros. 2 sold over 2.5 million copies, becoming the best-selling Famicom Disk System game. No doubt because it was a sequel to the best-selling Famicom game at the time. Sorry Legend of Zelda. With the game's success, Nintendo of Japan sent a copy to Nintendo of America for review. There, product analyst Howard Phillips, without warning, received the copy of Super Mario Bros. 2, among other games. He was taken by surprise. Without hesitation, he booted the game up and tried it out. On his first attempt, he lost his first life to a poisonous mushroom. Phillips was stupefied at how difficult the game was and was not satisfied. Said he, As I continued to play, I found that Super Mario Bros. 2 asked me again and again to take a leap of faith and that each of those leaps resulted in my immediate death. This was not fun gameplay. It was punishment. Undeserved punishment. Phillips turned to Minoru Arakawa, president of Nintendo of America, to share his complaints about the game. Arakawa agreed. Super Mario Bros. 2 was too much like the first game, and it was too hard. The video game industry in North America had just started rebounding from the crash of 1983. To release a difficult and similar looking sequel to Super Mario Bros. would mean to give new gamers a reason to shy away from the Nintendo Entertainment System. Despite this, Nintendo of America still needed a sequel to help push Mario. Arakawa contacted Hiroshi Yamauchi, president of Nintendo of Japan and his father-in-law. He asked for a more accessible sequel to Super Mario Bros. Despite the R&D teams being inundated with projects, Yamauchi knew his son-in-law was right. Nintendo of America decided on retooling another game into a Mario game. In the summer of 1987, they found their answer. Kensuke Tanabe, a graduate of the Osaka University of Arts, joined Nintendo's R&D 4 team in April of 1986. His first idea for a game was one in which a player would scroll vertically instead of horizontally, but technical limitations of the Famicom and NES made programming that game complex. Tanabe shelved his prototype, but Nintendo had ways of recycling ideas. Fuji Television approached Nintendo about making games using characters from their upcoming summer festival, Dream Factory. The Dream Factory Festival took place in Osaka and Tokyo during the summer of 1987. It was almost like Carnival in Rio de Janeiro. Costumed events, live concerts, etc. Fuji TV used it to promote their programs and boost viewership. They figured collaborating with Nintendo would be a huge plus, seeing as how well the Famicom was selling. They asked Kensuke Tanabe to make a game using the mascots of the festival, four Arabic-themed characters, to which Tanabe agreed. After digging up his shelved prototype, Tanabe turned to Shigeru Miyamoto to go over the concept. Said Miyamoto, make something a little more Mario-like, an action game. As long as it's fun, anything goes. R&D 4 began development of the new game. Miyamoto served as producer, with Tanabe as director. Providing the soundtrack for Doki Doki Panic was Koji Kondo, composer for Super Mario Bros. Tanabe incorporated horizontal scrolling stages along with vertical stages from his prototype 
and gave the characters unique abilities. In no time, the game was ready. On July 10th, 1987, Nintendo released Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic or Dream Factory Heart Pounding Panic on the Famicom Disk System. This game opens with a cutscene. In the dream world of Moo, two children, Pokey and Peaky, read a storybook when all of a sudden, a mysterious hand emerges and pulls them inside. Their monkey rushes to the Dream Factory family for help. The team dives into the book to the children's rescue. Each character has unique traits, offering you a bit of strategy on how to get through each stage. Imagine, a play on the term Imagine, is the most balanced character, equaling in speed, strength, and jumping. His girlfriend Lena doesn't excel well in speed and strength, but when she jumps, she hovers for a period of time. Mama is the highest at jumping, but she's not very fast, and her strength is subpar. Papa is the fastest and the strongest, but his jump isn't as good as the others. The core gameplay revolves around the characters plucking things from the grass to use as weapons to throw at enemies, like a vegetable. You can also pluck bombs to wipe out enemies and break certain blockages, extra lives, clocks that stop time for about 10 seconds, and magic lamps. Throwing a lamp causes a door to appear. The door leads to another dimension where you can pick up a heart to increase your health gauge. And gather coins from the grass for the bonus slot machine to pick up extra lives after you clear the stage. You can also jump on top of an enemy to take a ride, especially on dangerous spots like floors riddled with sharp spikes. You can also pick up enemies and toss them at others. Occasionally, after taking out multiple enemies, you can find a heart to restore a health unit. As you progress through seven worlds, you come across enemies and artifacts based on the Dream Factory Festival. The game also features references to the Mario series, such as stars that grant temporary invincibility after picking up five sets of berries, Pal blocks from the Mario Bros. arcade game that wipe out all the enemies standing on the ground within the screen, coins, and even warp zones. The most common enemy to deal with at the end of most stages is Birdo, a dinosaur-like creature who can shoot eggs from her nose, which you can use to take her out. The pink one is the standard Birdo, but the red one can also shoot fireballs, while the greens only shoot fireballs, forcing you to hit her with other objects. Birdo takes three hits before she's beaten. At the end of each world, you face off against a boss. Mouser appears at the end of worlds 1, 3, and 5. He throws bombs at you. To beat him, you have to throw bombs on his platform. If a bomb blows up when he's too close to it, he takes a hit. In world 1, you need to do this 3 times. In world 3, it's 5 times. In world 5, it's 6, but it's more difficult as there are 2 pairs of spikes on the ground, leaving you little breathing room to land a hit. Triclide appears at the end of Worlds 2 and 6. He spews fireballs at you. To defeat him in World 2, you have to throw things at him three times while dodging his fireballs. In World 6, the platform he's standing on is higher and more narrow, and to throw things at him means you have to be awfully close to him. Fry Guy appears at the end of World 4. He too spits fire. Even after you hit him three times, he spawns four little Fry Guys, which bounce like crazy. Only one hit knocks one out, but for every one destroyed, the others bounce even faster. Probably best to knock them all out at once. The mask gate near the end of World 7 doesn't open immediately after picking up the crystal ball like one usually does. Instead, this one attacks you, and you need to throw mask blocks at it three times to get it to open its mouth and allow you in. Mamu, the giant toad, is the final boss at the end of World 7. If you throw enough vegetables into his mouth, you'll have defeated him, but watch out as he burps bubbles at you. These bubbles can also wipe out vegetables. In order to save Pokey and Peaky and see the true ending, you need to beat the game with all four characters. Since Doki Doki Panic has a save feature, it's no problem. Critics love Doki Doki Panic. Famitsu Magazine rated it 31 out of 40. One reviewer called it, quote, Basically, it's a Super Mario-like game, but the main character doesn't have a weapon. Instead, you pull vegetables out of the ground and hit enemies with them or catch enemy projectiles and use them to attack back. A very novel aspect indeed. Nintendo of Japan saw the game and thought it would be perfect for Nintendo of America to make an accessible Mario sequel out of. They sent a modified copy of the game across the Pacific Ocean for review. Since Fuji TV only owned the rights to the Dream Factory family, while Nintendo owned everything else. 
Releasing the game by replacing the Dream Factory family with Mario characters would avoid any legal issues. Howard Phillips tested the game out and enjoyed it. He passed the news on to Minoru Arakawa, who agreed. Around that time, Nintendo of America was preparing for the release of the new Nintendo Power magazine. Gail Tilden, Phillips' co-creator of this magazine, suggested that Super Mario Bros. 2 be featured on the cover to hype the game's release. The cover was designed by Will Vinton Studios, the same studio that made claymations for the California Raisins commercials. The cover featured clay versions of Mario and the main antagonist. In the summer of 1988, Nintendo Fun Club members received the first issue of Nintendo Power free of charge. In addition to the cool cover art, it also featured tips and tricks on the first few stages of Super Mario Bros. 2. In October of 1988, Nintendo of America released Super Mario Bros. 2 in North America. What are some differences between this and Doki Doki Panic? Here are the most obvious. The Dream Factory has been replaced with the Mario team. Imogen, the most balanced character, was replaced with Mario. The Hovering Lena was replaced with Princess Toadstool, aka Princess Peach. The High Jumping Mama was replaced with Luigi. Mama? Mama Luigi? <laughs> and the Fast and Strong Papa was replaced with Toad. In addition, Nintendo replaced Mauser in World 5 with a giant enemy crab named Claw Grip. He throws rocks at you, and you have to throw those rocks right back at him to beat him. While still a bit of a struggle, it was much easier than the World 5 Mauser battle. The main antagonist, Mamu, was renamed to Wart. The opening sequence from Doki Doki Panic was omitted completely and replaced with text explaining that Mario had a dream about a different world known as Subcon. Later, Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad have a picnic when suddenly a door appears. Mario and the team open the door and enter Subcon to save it from the oppression of the evil wart. In addition, there were changes to make it even more like a Mario game. In Doki Doki Panic, holding the B button doesn't speed up your character. This feature was added in Super Mario Bros. 2. In Doki Doki Panic, taking a hit simply takes away a health bar. In Mario 2, you shrink down when you're down to one health bar, just like in the first game. The slot machine bonus game was also given a complete makeover. The lamps that take you to another dimension are replaced with potions. In those dimensions, the hearts that increase your maximum health are replaced with mushrooms. The graphics were also given some visual upgrades, such as the waterfalls, the floating cherries, and the grass. The mask blocks are also replaced with mushroom blocks. The mask gates are given a bird-like makeover. And since the game was converted from a disc to a 78 kilobyte cartridge, there's also no save feature. Rather than add a save battery like they did with The Legend of Zelda, they simply required the game to only be beaten once, with the ending of the game tallying the number of stages each character cleared. You also get two continues. All in all, Doki Doki Panic and Super Mario Bros. 2 may be similar, but Super Mario Bros. 2 was definitely the definitive version of the game. Super Mario is back! He's blasting through worlds where no one has ever been! He's taking on enemies no one else dares! This time Mario pops up power wherever he goes, so he's bigger and badder than ever before! You've never seen creatures like these! You've never had an adventure like this! It's everything you've dreamed of and worlds more! It's Super Mario 2, only from Nintendo! Now you're playing with power! Super Mario Bros. 2 became one of the hottest Christmas items of the 1988 holiday season, along with the Nintendo Entertainment System itself. However, for quite a while, the game was pretty hard to come by. The video game industry was suffering from a chip shortage around that time, resulting in limited quantities of each NES game, especially the new ones. The last Super Mario Bros. 2 was just sold. And they get upset. Well, they say, oh, can you take my name? Can you take my credit card, please? Can you do something? My kid wants it. His friend has it, and they're not friends anymore because he doesn't have it. It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. 
Nintendo video games. They first arrived from Japan uh, three years ago, and now millions of American kids are hooked and mesmerized. When they do stop to talk, it's in a language only they understand. Well, John Stossel went out to discover the secret of Nintendo's success, but first he had to find one. In ABC's news program, 2020, reporter John Stossel waited in line to find a copy of Super Mario Bros. 2 as a favor to his director. As he waited, he interviewed customers, one of whom had traveled all the way from Indiana to New York just to get a copy of the game. He came a thousand miles just for this game? Yes. I've done seven stores a day for three weeks now, and I cannot find it. I have to live with my kids for the rest of the year, so I have to have this on Christmas Day. Despite the chip shortage, Super Mario Bros. 2 managed to sell around 7 million copies. Critics heaped praise. Computer entertainers scored the game 3.5, stating, Like the first game, Super Mario Bros. 2 promises to provide many, many hours of enjoyment, frustration, delight, and discovery. This one is a worthy title and not to be missed. The game was also re-released in Japan for the Famicom in 1992 as Super Mario USA. However, reviews of Super Mario USA in Japan weren't quite as good as Doki Doki Panic. Famitsu gave it a score of 24 out of 40, claiming it was, quote, a reverse imported Mario. To be fair, this was five years after Doki Doki Panic, and it's more than likely that the review team was different. Today, Super Mario Bros. 2 still has its effect on the franchise. Many characters introduced in the game became staples, such as Birdo, the Shy Guys, and the bob -Oms. Wart and his main henchmen, however, never had a major presence in a Mario game since. But they have made appearances in the Super Smash Bros. series as collectible spirits. Wart also makes a cameo appearance in The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening on the Game Boy and the Nintendo Switch. Personally, I think replacing the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 with a Mario-fied Doki Doki Panic was the right decision. I mean, the game was so difficult and too similar to the first game, and with the video game industry getting back on its feet, it only made sense. But did you know the Japanese Mario 2 almost got a standalone release via Nintendo Power? According to John Irwin's boss fight book on Super Mario Bros. 2, Nintendo of America marketing director Gail Tilton stated, We weren't doing anything with it, so I worked up with my Nintendo Power Agency a campaign called The Lost Levels. A single cartridge containing the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 was made, but fearing that it would confuse the marketplace, the marketing campaign was scrapped. I remember when I played The Lost Levels on Super Mario All-Stars back when I was a kid, and was astonished at how tough it was. But All-Stars is where I also got my first experience with the Western Super Mario Bros. 2. And I didn't care about how different it was, it was just a Mario game. Especially if it's developed by the Mario team. Meanwhile, during the same month Super Mario Bros. 2 hit North America, in Japan, another Super Mario game was released. One that pushed the Famicom beyond its limits. Shortly after the release of Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan in 1986, Nintendo's Research and Development 4 team began a grueling development for their biggest Mario adventure yet, Super Mario Bros. 3. Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka served as directors and game designers, with Hideki Kono as an assistant director, Toshihiko Nakago as the main programmer, Kensuke Tanabe handling level and map designs, and Koji Kondo composing the soundtrack. Newcomer Katsuya Eguchi was brought on as a level designer. Miyamoto also served as producer. Thanks to the advancements in cartridge technology, which rendered the Famicom Disk System obsolete, the team had all the power they needed for the new Mario game they wanted. Among these advancements were the Multi-Memory Controllers, or MMC chips, boosting the capabilities of Nintendo's 8-bit hardware. Their latest game utilized a chip that allowed for screen splitting, extra RAM for diagonal scrolling, and animated titles. The MMC3 chip. With it, the team decided on new ideas. They attempted to make the game with an isometric view, but Miyamoto disapproves, stating, With the diagonal view from slightly overhead, you lost your sense of distance to the ground. Despite having no isometric view, a few traits carried over from the original idea such as the checkered floor in the opening. Other new ideas included allowing Mario to slide down hills on his rear end, 
pick up shells or icy blocks to kick at enemies, and fly. For Super Mario Bros. 3, graphically, nothing from the first two games was implemented. Everything was completely new. Super Mario Bros. 3 was originally planned for a release in the spring of 1988, but due to the team wanting to add new features, the release was delayed by six months. In addition to the traditional super mushrooms that make Mario big, fire flowers that allow Mario to shoot fireballs, and superstars that grant temporary invincibility, new power-ups were implemented. The Super Leaf gave Mario a raccoon tail and ears and allowed him to temporarily fly off a runway. He can also whip enemies with the tail. The P-Wing allowed Mario to fly throughout the entirety of a level until he got hit by an enemy. The frog suit slowed him down while walking on land, but allowed him to jump even higher and swim faster. The hammer suit turned Mario into a hammer brother, enabling him to chuck hammer projectiles at his enemies, and when he crouched, he'd be protected from fireballs. The tanuki suit turned Mario into a full-blown tanuki, allowing Mario not only the powers of the super leaf, but the ability to transform into a statue to repel enemy attacks temporarily. The suit was derived from the mythical raccoon dog in Japanese folklore. The development team also considered a power-up that would transform Mario into a centaur, but it was scrapped in favor of the Super Leaf. Other bonus items were added to compensate for having no save feature. Lakitu's Cloud allowed for Mario to skip a level. Hammers destroyed rocks in the path, allowing for shortcuts. Music boxes put moving enemies on the map to temporary sleep, letting Mario pass by them. Warp Whistle sent Mario to a warp zone to jump to a later world. This item in particular makes it so a player can beat it in a single sitting. New enemies were also introduced along with the usuals, including Boom Boom, the Boomerang Brothers, the Fire Brothers, the Sledge Brothers, which were Tubby or Hammer Brothers, Giant Cheap Cheeps known as Big Bertha or Boss Bass, the Angry Sun, and even enemies that would eventually appear more sporadically in the franchise. Dry Bones, Skeletal Koopa Troopas. Thwomps, rectangular rocks that attempt to stomp on Mario when he's near. Boos, little white ghosts that hide when Mario is close, but creep up on him when he looks away. Chain Chomps, sharp tooth ball and chain creatures that attack like rabid dogs. This idea was derived from Shigeru Miyamoto's experience with a neighbor's dog. And finally, the seven Koopaling bosses that occupied the castles and airships. Miyamoto based their designs on the seven programmers working on the game as a reward for their hard work. Backgrounds have more color, and on the overworld map screens, trees and bushes danced. Plus the opening had a bit of a theatrical trait, with a curtain rising to introduce the game and closing to end it. Rather than sliding down a flagpole and entering a fortress, Mario finished each stage by hitting a randomizer and walking off. Hitting the randomizer awarded a card with a mushroom, a fire flower, or a superstar. Three cards granted an extra life. Three of the same card granted more. Mario had eight new worlds to explore, each with a varied number of stages to clear, and a different visual theme. World 1, Grassland. A basic world with mostly green ground. World 2, Desert Hills, with quicksand in some areas. World 3, Oceanside, based around the deep blue sea. World 4, Big Island, featuring jumbo-sized enemies, blocks, and pipes. World 5, The Sky, with two maps, ground and sky, connected by a tower. World 6, Iced Land, a wintry world containing slippery floors and lakes. World 7, Pipe Maze a world of islands connected by a confusing network of pipes. And World 8, the Castle of Koopa, a sinister wasteland occupied by Bowser. There were overworld maps to connect the levels, and players could take their own path. Mushroom houses also provided players with power-ups that they could use before starting a level. There were spade panels in which players could play a minigame to try and line up pieces of a power-up to earn up to 5 extra lives. The end mark spade panel appeared every time 80,000 points were accumulated. 
These panels allow for players to earn extra lives, coins, and power-ups in a card matching game. The game also had a two-player option, unlike the first game in which players took turns when one player lost a life. In Mario 3, players could take turns when the other lost a life or completed a level. The two-player mode also featured a battle mode made in reference to the Mario Bros. arcade game. In the battle mode, players would battle it out for control of the game. They would also battle for each other's gold cards. R&D 4 also implemented more secrets into the game, such as a hidden warp whistle, white mushroom houses with bonus items, and even some hard-to-reach areas in certain levels. In worlds 1, 3, 5, and 6, clearing a level with a multiple of 11 in the coin total other than 0 and the 10's digit in the total score matching the number in the coin total transformed one of the Hammer Brothers on the map into a treasure ship, which allowed players to traverse a ship full of coins and take on the Boomerang Brothers for a bonus item. As for the music, Koji Kondo gave each world its own background music. Some tracks for the game were given percussion, The music for some overworld stages had a reggae feel to it. After over two years of development, the game was nearly finished. The game cost Nintendo over $800,000 to make. It also took up 3 megabits of cartridge storage. Compare that to the first game, which took up 320 kilobits, or 40 kilobytes. In September of 1988, previews of Super Mario Bros. 3 were shown. But it wouldn't be too long before gamers finally got the chance to actually play it. On October 23, 1988, after the release of Super Mario Bros. 2 in North America, Super Mario Bros. 3 was officially on store shelves in Japan. It would be an understatement to say that the game was a massive hit. Famitsu Magazine scored it 35 out of 40. By December of 1988, it was on top of the magazine's sales charts. It became the second best-selling game of the year, only behind NX's Dragon Quest III. Just like with the first game, Japan was hit with Mario Mania. There was merchandising, the game's soundtrack available on cassette and CD, and an anime retelling of fairy tales starring Mario 3 characters. By the time the game was released, Nintendo was facing some serious competition. A year earlier, NEC had released the PC Engine. For a short time, it actually managed to outsell the Famicom. And Sega was less than one week away from releasing their own 16-bit system, the Mega Drive. Super Mario Bros. 3 proved to be helpful in holding gamers over before the release of Nintendo's 16-bit system. It wouldn't be long before word of the game hit the rest of the world. A copy was sent to Nintendo of America for analysis. As North American gamers relished in the release of Super Mario Bros. 2, Nintendo of America's Howard Phillips received a copy of Super Mario Bros. 3 and played it for review. He was impressed. According to Kotaku, he recalled, For me, when I saw it, I thought this is not just another game, and it's not just a fun and challenging game. It was truly a quintessential video game. And that's how I rated it. If not the top rated game, Super Mario Bros. 3 was the second top rated game I ever gave during my time at Nintendo rating hundreds of titles. However, even though Super Mario Bros. 3 was much easier than the Japanese Mario 2, it was still a bit of a challenge. Some changes had to be made to make the game more accessible. In the Japanese version, when Mario took a hit while holding a power-up, he instantly shrunk down. Nintendo of America changed it so that Mario would stay as Super Mario after taking one hit. World 5-1 had a pipe leading to the goal. However, 
The sublevel in this stage contained the secret area. Thus, Mario could trigger a treasured box into spawning, resulting in some glitches. The pipe was removed entirely from the North American release. The Koopaling bosses were also given names. Product analyst Dave Brooks, being a big fan of music, named them after famous musicians. Ludwig von Koopa, the eldest, was named after composer Ludwig van Beethoven. Lemmy Koopa got his name from Lemmy Kilmister, frontman of the heavy metal band Motorhead. Roy Koopa, being the bespectacled Koopaling, was inspired by rock star Roy Orbison. Iggy Koopa was named in reference to the punk rocker Iggy Pop, frontman of the Stooges. Wendy O. Koopa, Wendy O. Williams of the Plasmatics punk rock band. The other two Koopalings, however, were not named after musicians. Morton Koopa Jr. was named after Morton Downey Jr., a tabloid talk show personality. Larry Koopa wasn't named after anyone famous. Brooks just gave him the name Larry because he just, quote, looked like a Larry. The Boos were also referred to as Boo Diddley after rock star Bo Diddley. The names for seven of the eight worlds were also changed. Desert Hills was changed to Desert Land. Oceanside was renamed Waterland. Big Island, Giant Land. The Sky, Skyland. Iced Land, Iceland. Pipe Maze, Pipeland. The Castle of Koopa, Darkland. But insiders wondered, when would Super Mario Bros. 3 be out in North America? Well, Nintendo was in a predicament. The 1988 chip shortage lasted through 1989, and even then, there was bigger fish to fry. Super Mario Bros. 2 hadn't even been out for a full year in North America, and it was making waves. And Nintendo was preparing for the release of the handheld Game Boy. A Super Mario game would be a part of the launch lineup. Releasing Super Mario Bros. 3 in 1989 would likely cut into Super Mario Bros. 2 sales and overshadow the Game Boy's launch. This delay, however, led Nintendo to hype up the game's release. Since January of 1989, Super Mario Bros. 3 was teased in Nintendo Power. In Issue 4, it was announced that Super Mario Bros. 3 would be coming to the PlayChoice 10 arcade cabinet. In issue number 5, on the same page that promoted Mattel's Power Glove, there was also a promotion for a contest to win a trip to the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, with the possibility of seeing Super Mario Bros. 3. People wrote about the game to Nintendo, wondering when and if it would come out. In issue number 6, one Super Mario Bros. fan wrote to Nintendo asking when Super Mario Bros. 3 would be released. Nintendo replied that Mario 3 was coming to play Choice 10, but also that there were no immediate plans to release it on the NES. However, in the same issue's Packwatch section, in which future releases were teased, Super Mario Bros. 3 was listed among the games slated for the future. Other magazines, such as Electronic Gaming Monthly and GamePro, added to the hype by importing the game from Japan and wrote previews with screenshots. On July 15, 1989, Super Mario Bros. 3 was released for PlayChoice 10 arcade cabinets. According to Nintendo of America's Director of Administration, Linda Weber, earnings for PlayChoice 10 had tripled with Mario 3's release. Meanwhile, Universal Pictures began production of a film that would bring the hype of Super Mario Bros. 3 to its peak, The Wizard. The film was released on December 15, 1989 in North America. The story was focused on nine-year-old Jimmy Woods, a silent boy trying to make his way to California. His older half-brother, Corey, played by Wonder Years actor Fred Savage, frees him from a mental institution to get him there. On their way, they meet Haley Brooks, a girl with her own agenda. And she and Corey soon discover Jimmy's extraordinary talent for playing video games. Just kicked ass on Double Dragon. They decide to enter Jimmy into Video Armageddon, a video game tournament held at Universal Studios Hollywood. The trio sets out for Los Angeles, stopping at arcades for practice along the way, with the boy's father and older brother and a greedy bounty hunter on their tail. The wizard was inundated with anything Nintendo. The NES, numerous games, the Nintendo Power Line, and Mattel's Power Glove. 
I love the power glove. It's so bad. Upon the movie's release, critics panned it for being a commercial for Nintendo products and the Universal Studios tour. I just like the blatant commercial plugolas. Despite that, The Wizard grossed over $14 million on a mere $6 million budget. But to those who saw the movie, critics and sales figures didn't matter. What did was the film's climax at Video Armageddon, where the finalists played... Super Mario Brothers! Many viewers considered The Wizard the first time they actually saw the latest Mario game for the NES in action. By the end of 1989, Nintendo fever continued to spread all across North America. Not only was the NES in over a fifth of US households at over 20 million units sold, but the Game Boy was also selling out. Nintendo Power had almost 2 million subscribers. The company was receiving 15,000 letters every week. There were around 5,000 World of Nintendo displays at stores nationwide. Despite Nintendo facing competition from the newly released TurboGrafx-16 and Sega Genesis, all the excitement for Super Mario Bros. 3 was now way beyond its peak. On February 12, 1990, Super Mario Bros. 3 was finally released in North America with a $25 million marketing campaign. Super Mario Bros. 3 from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. In its first two days alone, over 250,000 copies were sold. By the end of the year, that number jumped to 8 million. For a long time, Super Mario Bros. 3 had been touted as the best-selling standalone game ever. By 2000, the game had sold over 17 million copies, making it the third best-selling NES game of all time, just behind the first Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt. Like in Japan, critics in North America heaped praise upon Mario 3. Computer and Video Games Magazine gave it a score of 98%, referring to it as the Mona Lisa of gaming. In the United States alone, by 1992, Super Mario Bros. 3 garnered revenue of almost $600 million for Nintendo. On August 29th, 1991, Super Mario Bros. 3 reached PAL regions and was also critically acclaimed. Julian Rignall of Meme Machines considered it the finest video game he had ever played. In 1992, although much of the industry moved on to the 16-bit Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, Nintendo of America released a new NES console bundle, the Challenge Set, which came bundled with a copy of Super Mario Bros. 3. Since its release, fans of all ages became obsessed with Super Mario Bros. 3. The team of IFD, Ideas from the Deep, made a port of Mario 3 for PCs and sent a copy to Nintendo. Nintendo was impressed, but turned them down. But that didn't bother the IFD team. They took elements from their Mario 3 port and implemented them into Commander Keen, which went on to become a success in shareware. In 1991, IFD was rebranded as id Software which would go on to develop critically acclaimed first-person shooters such as Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. In my personal opinion, Super Mario Bros. 3 is a blast. It's my favorite NES game of all time. I first got to play it through Super Mario All-Stars, and it was a lot of fun. The idea of stocking up on so many power-ups was really interesting. I only wish it had been carried over to Super Mario World. It wasn't until 2007 when I finally got to experience the original 8-bit version of the game for myself on the Wii Virtual Console. And using what I learned in the 16-bit remake, I was able to beat the game. So, that wraps up the Super Mario Bros. games on the NES. They're all worth adding to your library. But believe it or not, this video is not done yet. Because while gamers awaited Super Mario Bros. 3 in North America, Nintendo was getting ready to launch the Game Boy. And with it, a new Mario title. Only this time, there was one exception. During the development of the Game Boy, Nintendo's Research and Development 1 team was tasked to develop new games for it. 
Nintendo of Japan president Hiroshi Yamauchi wanted a fun new Mario game to help drive sales of the new system. However, for the first time in the franchise's history, Shigeru Miyamoto and his team at R&D4 would not provide any input. Not that he didn't want any involvement. Development of the Super Famicom was underway, and the team was occupied with working on Super Mario World for the new 16-bit console. Handling development of the new Mario game for the Game Boy was R&D1, the same team that developed the Game Boy. Satoru Okada served as director, with Gunpei Yokoi as producer. R&D1 had experience in game development, dating all the way back to the Bean Gun toy line in 1970, and the Laser Clay shooting system in 1973. And of course, they were familiar with Mario, having worked with Miyamoto on Donkey Kong. Hirokazu Tanaka, who worked on sound design for the Donkey Kong games and Mario Brothers, worked on the soundtrack. Making a Mario game for the Game Boy was easy for Satoru Okada. All he had to do was shrink Mario's colorful surroundings into a small handheld system that only displayed four colors. With the new development team came a whole new land for Mario, Sarasa Land. The game was soon given the title, Super Mario Land. Nintendo of America had originally intended for Super Mario Land to be the pack-in title for the Game Boy, but instead, they decided on packaging it with Tetris, hoping that bundling the popular puzzle game would make the Game Boy appeal to a wider market. Super Mario Land was released alongside the Game Boy on April 21st, 1989 in Japan, July 31st, 1989 in North America, September 28th, 1990 in Europe, and November 21st, 1990 in Australia. In the game, the evil alien Tatanga, the mysterious spaceman, has taken over Sarasa Land by hypnotizing its inhabitants and kidnapping Princess Daisy. It's up to Mario to rescue the princess and save Sarasa Land. All along the way, he faces off against various Sarasa Land variations of Mushroom Kingdom enemies. The Nokobone, or Bombshell Koopa, almost looks like a Koopa Troopa. When Mario stomps on it, it explodes. Chibibo, or Goombo, clearly Sarasa Land's Goomba. Piranha plants are known here as Pakun flowers. Bullet Biffs are Sarasa Land's Bullet Bills. There's also power-ups to help Mario. Mushrooms make him bigger, and stars make him temporarily invincible. But the flowers here are not fire flowers, although they do look like them. They're Super Ball flowers. Mario's color doesn't change, this being a Game Boy game and all, but this power-up lets him shoot a bouncing projectile to wipe out enemies, including bosses, and gather coins. Hearts grant him extra lives. This is to get around the Game Boy's color limitations. In the Mario games on the NES and Famicom, a red mushroom enlarged Mario, while a green mushroom gave him an extra life. It couldn't be done on a handheld system that could only display four gray colors. So instead of a green one-up mushroom, it's a heart that gave Mario an extra life. But as usual, 100 coins also give an extra life. Another way to gain an extra life is a bonus stage. Clearing a non-boss level by going through the top entrance and clearing a boss level in any way entered a bonus stage where Mario could play for a Super Ball Flower or up to three extra lives. Sarasaland had four different kingdoms for Mario to explore, each with three stages. Birabuto looks similar to ancient Egypt with pyramids in the background and sphinx-like creatures. The boss is King Totometsu, a fire-breathing lion-sphinx hybrid. Muda, based on the island of Bermuda, is the essential water world of this game. There's numerous fish enemies to go through. The third stage of the kingdom is an auto-scrolling shoot-'em-up stage where Mario fires projectiles from a submarine. Dragonza Masu, a seahorse enemy, takes the boss role. Easton, with all those Moai statues and enemies known as Tokotoko, is obviously based on Easter Island. Hyoihoi is the boss of this stage, tossing boulders at Mario, which he can jump on to get past the enemy. 
Finally, we have Chai, based on ancient China. Among the enemies are Pyeongpi, undead enemies based on the Jiangxi, mythical creatures from Chinese folklore. Also appearing are Rotodiscs, the rotating fire obstacles from Mario 3. The final stage is another shmup, except Mario is shooting from a plane. The boss of this kingdom is Byokenton, an unseen coward hiding behind a cloud who bombards Mario with chickens. Once he's beaten, Tatanga appears for the final boss battle. Now about the shooter stages, did you know that Shigeru Miyamoto actually intended for the original Super Mario Bros. to have shoot-'em-up levels? Said Miyamoto, We originally thought about having a shoot-'em-up stage where Mario jumps on a cloud and shoots at enemies, but we dropped it because we wanted to focus on the jumping action. The sky-based bonus stages are the remnants of that idea, you could say. Upon the game's release, critics praised it. Paul Rand of Computer and Video Games Magazine stated, Hectic action, including loads of hidden bonus screens dotted throughout the four big worlds, combined with remarkable graphics, considering their size, and rousing tunes and effects ensure yet another thumbs up for the Game Boy. In its third issue, Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it 31 out of 40. Ed Semrad stated, Easily the best Game Boy cart. Super Mario Land should be your first purchase. Pipes, hidden coin rooms, and one-ups, they're all here just waiting to be discovered. It's Super Mario Bros. all over again, and it's fantastic. Dan Nauert felt the same way. He also stated, There are loads of secret things to uncover, and new screens that add to the Super Mario theme. Shockingly, Super Mario Land sold over 18 million copies worldwide, about a million more than Super Mario Bros. 3, making it the fourth best-selling Game Boy game of all time. Seeing as it was a launch title for a big-time seller like the Game Boy, it makes sense. The game was so popular that it inspired comics, drinking glasses, a song by the Ambassadors of Funk, and even a ROM hack and a homebrew. Tatanga would make a return to the series in Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, as the boss of the Space Zone. Princess Daisy, having made her debut in Super Mario Land, remains a staple in the Mario universe. My take on Super Mario Land? Well hey, it's Mario on the Game Boy! Who cares how short and simplistic it is? So what if Mario's controls are stiff? I mean, yes, the sequels are superior in many ways, but the first game has always been my favorite on the Game Boy, next to Tetris, of course. My only gripes, aside from the lack of color, no Luigi, no Princess Peach, no Toad, and no Bowser. Just Mario and a few enemies from the franchise. Plus, the game was made on a 64 kilobyte cartridge, Compare that to the other Mario games I talked about earlier. But that's okay. A Mario game is a Mario game, and Super Mario Land was more than enough to show off the Game Boy's potential. So overall, Super Mario Bros. has become a mainstay in video games and in pop culture in general. Maybe even beyond that. Now I know what you're thinking. Why stop at Super Mario Land? Well, there's just too many Mario games to list. And I'll definitely bring up the Super Mario Bros. games of the 90s in another video. For more information on Mario 2 and 3, I highly recommend checking out the Gaming Historians videos. They explain the development of both games in full detail. I'll leave links in the description below. Thanks again for watching Gaming Delight. Until next time, happy gaming!